So welcome to the first episode of my podcast. I'm Chris Stevens, and I'm going to be talking about addiction and recovery. So it was interesting. I had a Facebook memory uh, pop up on my Facebook feed uh, just yesterday, and it reminded me of one of the last times that I'd got on the drug ice. And I remember the day, well, uh, me and Casey had just kind of started getting back together and she had gone to visit her friend in Adelaide. And of course, a whole lot of my insecurities and discomfort about her being away and all my insecurities bubbling up. And, you know, I really just had an incredible urge uh, to get on. And I organized it. I, you know, I watched my son do one or two events. And, you know, I was able to then justify, okay, well, you know, I've done, I've done enough. I've, I've watched him run a few races for his sports day. It's, it's all about me now. And, um, you know, what happened after that was uh, about 40 minutes later, I was smoking ice in a public toilet. And I then went to my apartment and masturbated to pornography um, until I kind of realized that I was supposed to be picking up my kids um, from school at 3.30. And I, you know, just the devastating effect that drugs have had on me um, has been profound. Um, but it was just such a shocking day to then turn up to school at, you know, 4.30 and, um, you know, get the kids off my fucking head. I mean, it just, it wasn't fucking pretty, but, um, you know, that was two years ago. And, you know, the podcast that I'm, you know, doing today is just about my story and how, how did I get into drugs? And, you know, for me, I, I mean, I was really into sport as a young kid. I, you know, I was a national national level athlete in two sports. So I was a national royal lifesaving champion and I was a national level swimmer. So my childhood was filled with sport. It was filled with activity. And I can tell you that, you know, I used to hate if someone sparked up a cigarette around me, I would absolutely hate it. I would be so offended. And I was also so, you know, strict. I mean, I wouldn't eat a piece of my own birthday cake on my birthday because I was so into sport. I was into competing. And it was a real surprise to everyone, including myself, that I ended up the way I did, you know, so fucked up on drugs. And, um, you know, so let, let's go back to, to, to that kind of time when I first, you know, took drugs. And the first drug I took uh, was marijuana. And, you know, and the reason why I started, you know, taking drugs was because, as I said, I was a national level athlete. But, you know, what was plaguing me was the social pressures at school. You know, there were girls that I liked at school and, you know, you were gonna, you know, supposed to meet up with them at the party, whoever was having the party on the Friday night or the Saturday night. And, you know, I would promise people that I was going, yeah, I'm gonna be there, you're gonna be there, you're gonna be there. And I knew I ne never was gonna be there. You know, first of all, my parents wouldn't have allowed me to go. And of course, because I had a swimming competition the next day or I had swimming training the next day. So, you know, it was, it was a real social pressure you know, that eventually kind of made me decide, like, you know, gee, what do I want to do? Go to parties on the weekend and kiss girls and do all that stuff and have fun? Or, you know, do I want to continue swimming? And, you know, for anyone who's ever, you know, competed at a high level of swimming, it's it's such a big commitment. It's a huge life commitment. I mean, it's basically what you do. You don't really do much else than, you know, sleep, eat, swim. You know, it's it's pretty much like that. So, you know, it was it was the real social pressure. It was me realizing that, you know, I didn't want to swim anymore. And and this was the real 
beginning of the trauma that propelled my drug use. You know, a lot of people, you know, they, you know, I, I, it's so obvious to understand why they're all on drugs. I mean, they're, 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 they're early child, I mean, there was shit going on really fucking bad from a really fucking early age. And, and I can say that that wasn't the case for me. I mean, I, I actually had a pretty pleasant early childhood. Um, and it wasn't until I hit adolescence um, that I, you know, I really decided that I didn't want to swim anymore, that I, I really understood how much my parents wanted me to do that. And, you know, they wanted it way more than I did. And, you know, that was a great sense of anxiety for me. I knew that I would be letting not only my parents down, my coach down, uh, there was a lot of people who expected big things from me. And I knew that, you know, yeah, I was going to let them down. And it, and it fucking, it, it bothered me. It bothered me. And, you know, my real first, you know, heartbreak was when I told my parents that I no longer wanted to compete and swim anymore. And the first thing they said to me was, you're a fucking idiot. You know, just basically just hurled into abuse. And, and I kind of, I guess, expected it, um, you know, but it still didn't change the fact that it hurt me deeply. You know, I, there was plenty more I could have done. I mean, I wasn't born to be a swimmer, you know, and I certainly wasn't born and none of us are born to kind of do what our parents fucking tell us to do. And I think that, you know, it's a, it's a real problem. I think it causes a lot of resentment um, between a lot of parents and their children. And um, it's certainly something that I'm glad I've experienced myself because I certainly won't be, you know, pushing my kids to do anything that they don't really feel passionate about and want to do. But, you know, it really got bad when I, I, um, I went to another room in the house where there was a wall and a sliding door that divided the kitchen and another room. And I remember just standing um, at the door and listening through and just hearing um, my parents attack me and abuse the fuck out of me, right? And um, it just changed me. That, that moment um, really fucking changed me because I'd only ever wanted to please them. I mean, I, I really only ever wanted to please my parents. I just wanted to make them proud. I, you know, but I, I just, I didn't want to swim anymore. And, um, I wanted to, I wanted to be a teenager. I, I wanted to experience other things and, um, to not have that support from your parents and to hear them talk about you so terribly was, was life changing. It was, it was what probably two or three days after that that I was smoking my first bong, and um, you know how was that? Well, no one told me to pull your finger off the shoddy hole, so I drank the fucking bong. Um, it was fucked, but you know I kind of enjoyed it, and. You know, it, 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 it was the next day I was doing it again. Um, and it was, what, a week later I was doing acid. So it was just incredible how quickly my life changed. And from there, it just got really out of control really quickly. So after that... I, you know, because again, I, I connected with all of these people who I wouldn't normally socialize with. So, you know, when I was swimming and, and doing into all of that sports stuff, I mean, all I kind of, I mean, I went to school, basically wasn't paying much attention, fell asleep in class often, but really my social, my socializing was with other swimmers, was with other athletes because, you know, that's where I was every weekend. I mean, I was at a swimming competition, I was in a life-saving competition, or I was training, or I was at a friend's house who swam, or, you know, doing something like that. So, you know, when I started doing drugs, what, what that was, was that meant 
I was doing a whole new set of activities with a whole new set of people. So, you know, that's kind of where my social, you know, group stayed, you know, basically until, you know, nearly just about, you know, nearly two years ago, since I've stopped using drugs. I mean, I, I do no longer socialize with people who, who use drugs. And, you know, that's basically what I did from the age of, you know, 15 to 35. So from 15 to 35, I was really only hanging around and having social, you know, interactions with people who, who use drugs. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of incredible, you know. I mean, I, what surprised me then was just how emotional I got when I recalled the day that I changed inside. And I guess that's why I, I do understand and I am compassionate to the people who do use drugs. And, you know, if you've seen my videos and things like that on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and things like that, you know, you can often, you know, mistake me for being incredibly judgmental, incredibly harsh, you know, not really dis not really compassionate at all. And it's just not the case. I mean, I think that, you know, when I do make those videos, I am on purpose trying to provoke you and trying to annoy you um, because I just know how annoying it is to be a drug addict. Um, and, you know, you can pretend that it's fucking cool and it's okay or it's not really a fucking problem. But, um, you know, I certainly know that it is. And yeah, it's just, it's just incredible actually just how I feel after just sharing that story. I mean, I'm just breaking out into a sweat because obviously, you know, there's, there's moments in your life that just completely change you. And, you know, it's why it's so important that, you know, I was able to stop using drugs. And I think one of the, the biggest challenges for me you know, when I first wanted to quit quit drugs, you know, it was around the around the time I had I had children. I've got four children, and you know, I can remember, you know, when my first son Hugo was born, that I was like, right, no drugs. And you know what what actually happened was is that you know with a, another child. And again, we always had businesses as well. So you know, the, the amount of times that I've had a child whilst opening a new business um, has been often. You know, it's happened, well, we've got four kids and it's happened two times. So 50% of the time I've been, you know, having a new cold child, sorry, whilst opening a new business. And, you know, this was just something that I never really um, understood the pressure of. I mean, you know, having a newborn baby, such a, an intense time, and, you know, opening a business at the same time is just absolutely crazy. And, you know, it was, it's funny when I think about it now, you know, I mean, because I was such a drug addict, you know, trying to stop using drugs when you're in the middle of opening a business and having a new baby, it was never going to happen. You know, so of course I continued to use drugs, you know, with my, you know, having children and, you know, drug that kid, my kids have seen me do drugs often. I... Um, you know, I made a video the other day and it was, I, I was chatting to my oldest son and he said that I, I, you know what, I can't even remember the last time you did drugs, dad. And I was just like, well, isn't that kind of awesome? Because every child that I had, I was absolutely convinced that I was going to be able to stop using drugs. And, you know, that just goes to show you how powerful addiction is you know I wasn't able to stop using when I had my children and in fact I used more and this was very very difficult for me um, because I was living you know with the shame of being a drug addict father um, and, it, and it really it really bothered me 
Um, but but yeah, I mean, you know, from 16 years of age, drugs really dominated my life. And because of the way that they made me feel, you know, again, when I had my heart broken for the first time and it was my parents breaking my heart, um, that was a horrible nagging pain that I just, it was just the perfect timing. It was just, you know, that right age when I, just before I'd left school, you know, you know, and, you know, there, there was this other side of the world calling to me, you know what I mean? It's like not the athlete healthy world, it's the, the drugs, the parties world. And, and I just kind of gravitated to that. And it was just at that, at that fucking timing, you know what I mean? It was like the, the tragedy happened and then there was these whole new people and this drugs and it just, it really was just destined to be um, a real fucking problem. And, you know, it has been. And, you know, one thing I kind of, you know, can think about looking back now is just, you know, I, I loved all, all drugs. I mean, it was just a, a whole new world where I could, you know, experience all of these drugs and experience partying and experience doing all of these other things. And, you know, it wasn't until... It wasn't until I found synthetic weed that I ever thought I had a real drug problem. Now, I would have been 26 or 27. I think I would have been 26. So just imagine, so from 16 to 26, I never really um, felt like I was an addict, even though I was at times homeless, even though at times I was breaking in to houses, even though, you know, I, I was a fucking drug addict. I never really saw myself as a drug addict. And, you know, that was largely to do because I was a young guy. I didn't have any real fucking responsibility. So... You know, my life was already pretty unmanageable. So it wasn't like, you know, it just wasn't something I was aware of that I had a problem as big as I did. But, you know, it's it's interesting to kind of think back to synthetic weed because firstly, it was the strongest fucking drug I've ever had. And I've had all of them. Um, and what was even more bizarre is that it was fucking legal. So... Let's just have a chat about that. So I remember I was just about to uh, start a cafe, Big Bear Cafe in Glen Huntley Road. And I was painting, you know, the front of the shop with a mate of mine, Mark. And um, we noticed that there was a Club X down the road. I mean, I knew that there was a Club X down the road, but I kind of saw the manager fucking walking past. He'd just been up to, you know, get his lunch. So he was walking down and, we stopped and had a chat and he said, oh, you know, is this your shop? I said, yeah, mate, just opening a cafe. And I said, you know, you obviously fucking work at the sex shop. I mean, you know, what's it like? Is it fucking busy in there? And his response to me was, oh, mate, ever since we've got this fucking synthetic weed, it's just been crazy. And I'm like, oh, yeah, fuck, synthetic weed. You know, I, mean, I fucking smoke ice, mate. I snort coke, you know what I mean? Like, what are you fucking going to impress me with this fucking synthetic weed that's fucking legal, you know, I was just, uh, give it a try, mate, you know, and so my mate went in, got a packet of it, and anyway, I was just, after we'd done the painting and we, we'd bought the fucking shit, we were going to drive down to Richmond and order all of the chairs, and, you know, I remember rolling up this fucking cigarette, you know, with this synthetic shit, and anyway, we... I'd start the car. So Mark's in the fucking passenger seat. I'm in the driver's seat driving. He has a fucking puff of it. And he just, I just remembered the look on his face. He just looked at me and was like, like that, like almost like, you know, take it. And I remember having it and, um, 
Fuck me. Where the fuck did I go? Um, I, it's hard to describe the intensity of that drug. And it's hard to believe that I actually made it to my destination. And when I got to my destination, I had no idea really how I'd got there or what the fuck I was there for. And it was so almost scary and exciting because, oh my God, I don't even know how I fucking got here and what the fuck am I here for? You know, that it was just, I was just in love with it. I was absolutely fucking in love with it. And the problem with that was, is that, well, I'm just starting a business. I've never had a cafe before. I'm just starting a cafe. My partner's just had a baby and I decide to fall in love with fucking synthetic weed. So this was really when I ever believed and understood that I am a drug addict. It was synthetic weed. And I think the reason because of that was because I was always financially successful. I'd always been good at making money. And you know what I mean? You make money, you snort coke, you smoke a bit of ice, you smoke a bit of weed, you drink, and, you drink every day. For me, that was, I, I, you know, I wasn't an addict. I make money. I, 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 I was able to, I was functional, basically. And, you know, what this synthetic weed did, it was made me unfunctional. And it nearly fucking killed me. Um, it was the first time that my partner had left me. Um, it was the first time that I really didn't want to do anything else but smoke this drug. Like, you know, once upon a time I was enthusiastic. I mean, I'd, I've always kind of gone to the gym. I didn't want to fucking do the gym. I didn't want to fucking work. I didn't want to fucking do anything. I just wanted to smoke this fucking drug. And, you know, it got that fucking bad where I was tricked into going to the Alfred Hospital. So, you know, there's some people that were close to me, um, you know, told me that one of my sons was in the hospital and I had to get there. And, you know what I mean? After a big delay, you know, I managed to get there, but it wasn't to see a sick son. It was uh, you know, to be taken and, you know, fucking helped. And, you know, it didn't fucking help at all. I mean, I was kept in a room um, for a few hours and, and whatever, but, you know, really this drug, this drug fucked me up bad. Um, you know, to the point where, you know, I, I was going on a holiday to, uh, to Bali or Thailand with the family and we got there and the plane was delayed and I was fucking wrapped. Rang me, mate, bring me a fucking bag of this shit. The fucking, the plane's been delayed, right? So he brings me a bag of shit and, you know, I'm that fucking hooked on it. Um, I'm smoking it in the plane. So, you know, family man, you know, running businesses, got a property portfolio, you know, on the outside looks almost successful. However, I was really fucked. And I think the fact that because I was, like people couldn't put it together. You could obviously smell the fucking smoke in the plane. Um, you know, obviously no one fucking said anything to me to my surprise. But, you know, what was, what was fascinating, and this is, you know, hopefully insightful um, for anyone listening, is that what was incredible was that when I got off the plane, and obviously all the shit was gone because I'd smoked all on the plane, when I got to Thailand, it was Thailand, and we'll stay in this beautiful, bloody, private villa thing, I didn't think of it once. Isn't that incredible? Like, it was like my environment, like the environment changed, and all of a sudden, I just had no desire to smoke this fucking drug. There was no... It was just crazy. But of course, the first thing I did when I get back was go and get get the fucking packet. And you know, this was 
probably 18 months. For 18 months, I was so heavily addicted to this drug. And again, I'd even used, I tried to use ice to get off it, but it was just, it was stronger than ice. Um, I'd, I'd started to use oxys. I started to use oxys to get off it and stronger than oxys or kind of on par. But, you know, it was, it was that fucking bad for me that I, you know, remember, you know, Casey having another child and, you know, me being completely fucked. And she's saying, look, I'm having the baby, Chris. I'm having the baby. We've got to go to the hospital. And I'm just couldn't give a fuck. I was just not fucking interested in driving to the hospital. I'm fucking off my fucking head and I'm happy doing that. And after nagging me for about fucking half an hour to an hour, I finally said, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to take you to the hospital. And... You know, what happened then was, you know, we get to the hospital car park and she said, oh, you know, you're going to have to go in. I'm having the baby. And I said, Casey, what do you fucking mean? We're, we're here. We're at the car, we're in the car park, underground car park. Let's just go in and have the baby. She said, Chris, no, I'm having the fucking baby now. Go and get help. And you reckon I'd just fucking bolt nonstop until I fucking got help. But no, before I got in the lift, I fucking rolled another fucking smoke. I was fucking hooked, mate. Fucking hell, drug addiction's fucked. And the more I think about it, the more I just think, God, it's a fucking horrible fucking thing to have. It's a real fucking horrible thing to have. And anyone who fucking gloats about fucking using drugs and how good they are is an absolute fucking idiot, according to me. So anyway, I had this fucking joint. I fucking, you know, finally get in the elevator and I'm walking down the fucking hallway and, you know, there's a reception desk with four staff there. And, you know, the lady says to me, oh, are you okay? Do you need help? And I'm going, no, um, my missus is having the baby. And they're like, oh, okay, what when she booked in for? And I'm like, no, she's having the baby in the car park. And they're like, oh, fuck, all right, shit. So come down, get in the wheelchair and uh, bring the wheelchair down with us. And anyway, I as we're walking towards the car, I see Casey on her hands and knees and it's almost like she's looking, like I thought, oh fuck, she's cleaning the car. She's not having the baby. She's decided to clean the car because she looked like she was up on her knees on the fucking front seat trying to grab something. But anyway, we get there and as soon as we fucking get there, the fucking baby just fucking pops out, right? So just fucking incredible. Like that's that's just how fucking addicted I was and just how much I didn't give a fuck that, you know, my missus is having a fucking baby and I'm just like, ah, oh, it's no big fucking deal. And it gets worse. So, you know, she has the baby and we're in there. And by this stage, it's, you know, early in the morning and I'm fucking out of gear. So what do I do? You know, being a fucking dirty fucking drug addict, you fucking make up a lie, an excuse. So I said, oh, look, I've got to go get something from the car. And, um, you know, I didn't have to go get something from the car. I had to go get something from the fucking drug shop. So... That's what I did. I drove the car and, you know, it was, I think it was a Sunday and the fuckhead had slept in. So I'm thinking, oh, I can kind of, you know, do it in about half an hour, 35 minutes, but he was late. He slept in. So by the time he gets there, I'm ready to cave his head in. And instead I had to just be polite. Oh, yeah, hey, mate, finally you fucking hear that. They get, you know, and then go back to the hospital. So it was just a horrible fucking time. And, um, you know, it was the first time that, you know, like I said, they all left. And, you know, when my family left, you know, the sad thing is, is it was actually a relief. Like, thank fuck, they're gone. Now I can just smoke on the couch all fucking day. And, you know, again, it just, it does just remind me just how awful addiction is because, you know, it, it takes you away from what's really important. And, you know, you, you give all of this time, effort, and energy into something that's just fucking killing you and you neglect the most important things, which is your children, you know, and your family. So really that was the time where I thought drugs had fucked me, you know, for, for, for a decade, 
you know, or so before that. It was just really, I didn't really see, you know, drugs as a problem. However, they always were. And, you know, going back to my story about, you know, listening to my parents, you know, abuse me and basically tell, you know, tell me I was fucking nothing. He's a loser. He's got no hope. He's going to amount to nothing. You know, it really was the thing that changed me, you know, and, you know, that's where I, like, where I am today is, you know, and it took me a long time. It took me a long time not to believe what my parents were saying that day. You know, so many of us just don't think we're good enough. So many of us don't think we're worthy of love, that we don't think we're worthy of being loved. We don't think we're worthy of being listened to. We just don't think that we're fucking good enough. And it's it's something that I'm hoping to bring light to. You know, I kind of, I mean, I'm doing this because I want to share with you, of course, you know, my story of addiction and just kind of let you know, yeah, I was, it was really fucking bad. But but really too, I, I, I want to share with you, you know, my story of recovery and the process of how that happened and how that began. But, you know, that was my first episode. It was a, a brief kind of, um, you know, insight into you know, how it all began for me, you know, where, when did the drugs begin? And now, you know, so thank you for listening. And I'll see you next week.